uh, ask to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. I've been advised of the situation and I'll be back with him within a half an hour. And that's all. Yes, sir.
I met you once before when we were serving in Mexico. You came over from General Scott's headquarters to visit Garland's brigade, to which I then belong. I remember your appearance, and I'm sure I would have recognized you anywhere. Yes, I know we met on that occasion. And I've often thought of it and tried to recollect how you looked, but have never been able to recall a single feature. That was some army we had back in Mexico, wasn't it, General? Those were very different times, indeed. I suppose, General Grant, the object of our present meeting is fully understood. I asked to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. The terms I propose are those as stated substantially in my letter of yesterday. That is, the officers and men to be paroled and disqualified from taking up arms again until properly exchanged. The arms, ammunition, and supplies will be given up as captured property. Those are about the conditions I expected would be proposed. Yes, I think our correspondence of the last few days has indicated pretty clearly the uh, action to be taken at our meeting today. And I hope that it leads to a general suspension of hostilities and may be the means to prevent any further loss of life. I suppose, General Grant, we have both carefully considered the proper steps to be taken and would suggest you commit to writing the terms which you have proposed. I'll write them out. General R. E. Lee, commanding CSA Army. General, in accordance with the substance of my letter to you of the 8th instant, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia on the following terms. To wit, roles of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer <clears throat> to be designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate. The officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the United States until properly exchanged. And each company or regimental commander to sign a like parole for the men of his command. The arms, artillery, and public property are to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officers appointed by me to receive them. This will not embrace the sidearms of the officers nor their private horse or baggage. This done, officers and men will be allowed to return to their homes, not to be disturbed by the United States authority so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. Very Respectfully, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General.
After the words until properly, the word exchange seems to be omitted. You doubtless intended to use the word. Yes, I thought I'd put in the word exchanged. I presumed it had been omitted inadvertently. And with your permission, I will mark where it should be inserted? Certainly. This will have a very happy effect upon my army. Unless you have some suggestions as to the form in which I've stated the terms, I'll have a copy of the letter written in ink and sign it. There is one thing I would like to mention. Cavalrymen and artillerists send their own horses in our army. Its organization in this respect is different from that of the United States. I would like to understand that these men will be allowed to retain their horses. No, you'll see the terms as written do not allow it. Only the officers may keep their private property. No, I see the terms do not allow it. That is clear. I won't change the terms as they're now written. However, I will instruct the officers that I appoint to take the paroles to allow any man who claims to own a horse or mule to take that animal with them to work their little farms. This will have the best possible effect upon the men. It will be very gratifying and do much towards conciliating our people. I have a thousand or more of your men as prisoners, General Grant. Some of them officers whom we have acquired to march along with us for several days. I would like to send them into your lines as soon as it can be arranged, for I have no provisions for them. I indeed have nothing for my own men. They have been living for the past few days principally upon parched corn. I'm sorry, but we have no forage for the animals. In fact, we've had to rely on the countryside for our own supply of forage. I would like to have our men sent within our lines as soon as possible, and I will take steps at once to supply your army with rations. Of about how many men does your present command consist of? Indeed, I cannot say. My losses in killed and wounded have been exceedingly heavy. And besides, there have been many stragglers and some deserters. My own public reports and letters, and indeed my private letters, had to be destroyed on the march to prevent them from falling into the hands of your people. Many companies are entirely without officers, and I have not seen any returns for several days, so I have no means to ascertain our present strength. Suppose I send over 25,000 rations. Do you think that will be sufficient? I think that will be ample, and it will be a great relief, I assure you. I would like to know that General Meade will be notified of the surrender so that firing might not break out. To save time, I'll send two messengers through your lines to General Meade's headquarters. Very well. God bless you, General. General Order Number 9, Headquarters, 
Army of Northern Virginia, April 10, 1865. After four years of arduous service, marked by unsurpassing courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. I need not tell the brave survivors of so many hard-fought battles who have remained steadfast to the last that I have consented to this result from no distrust of them. But feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that would compensate for the loss that must have attended the continuance of the contest, I determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen. By the terms of the agreement, officers and men can return to their homes and remain until exchanged. You will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed, and I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you his blessing and protection. With an increasing admiration of your constancy and devotion to your country, and a grateful remembrance of your kind and generous considerations of myself, I bid you all an affectionate farewell. R. E. Lee, General. But I don't know about this here stuff. Yeah. Get some bread. It looks good. Where do you get your shoes? When do you get your shoes? <laughs> well, I got a good pair here. I think they'll get me back to North Carolina. You think so? I think so. What part of North Carolina? Well, down in the southern part of the state. Down next to South Carolina. Mmm, that's a quite a hoof from here. ways to go. What? What is that? Coffee. Coffee? Oh. Coffee and sugar mess. See, I, I normally don't take there to get his first. I normally don't take <laughs> sugar in my coffee. <laughs> what group are you with? But, uh, 14th North Carolina. 14th. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know you've probably heard of us.
He never wanted to be the president. He successfully defended his nation for four long and bloody years, while 700,000 soldiers and civilians lost their lives in a great and tragic civil war. He wanted to emancipate all the black slaves in the South with compensation to their owners and complete the process he himself had started towards racial equality in this country. He fought his entire life to preserving the Union of States and to defending the Constitution set forth by the Founding Fathers. He was attacked by traitors from other states, men who declared open rebellion against the nation and sought to forever divide the states north and south, men who invaded his capital and sought to murder him in cold blood, men who were only interested in money. He was one of the greatest presidents this nation has ever had. His suffering is legend and his character unwavering. Abraham Lincoln was not his name. And you know, Wink told me there was a man in this town. I don't know who he, he told me at the time, but I couldn't tell you. And said, do you know he would never come up Avenue? <laughs> he said he was a friend of the white lady. <laughs> <laughs>
send in the boys. And may God forgive me for the order.